Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Let's take up the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper by looking at an editorial from page number 6 of the Delhi edition. This editorial deals with the topic of microplastics and waste management. This topic is in news because recently an NGO conducted a study on the Ganga River in order to identify the concentration levels of microplastics in the waters of the Ganga. The findings of this study are quite alarming as it has found very high levels of concentration in and around Varanasi, Kanpur and Haridwar. The findings of this study was discussed in detail in our yesterday's analysis and this study has identified the presence of very high levels of concentration of microplastic particles in the size of 300 micrometers to 5 mm and their sources have been traced to untreated sewage which is being directly let into the ganga river along with inefficient handling of solid waste accompanied with massive inflow of industrial effluents into the river all these sources have contributed to rising levels of microplastics in the ganga river thereby raising a serious environmental concern see as you all know plastic waste in any form is non degradable and it is also a persistent pollutant as it tends to remain in the environment for hundreds of years and in some cases even up to thousands of years under plastic waste we have a new category of waste that we classify as microplastics which has become an emergent concern microplastics are those plastic waste materials which are less than 5 mm in size and today it has been attributed to be the primary cause of marine pollution around the world latest studies have recorded the presence of microplastics even in some of the most remotest and pristine environments including on the mount everest in the arctic in the icelandic glaciers and as well as in the depths of the mariana trench so microplastics have invaded our terrestrial aquatic and marine environments and eventually these microplastics they tend to accumulate in the water bodies including the lakes and the rivers and finally drain into the seas and the oceans thereby contributing to extensive marine pollution these microplastics can be categorized into primary and secondary categories and primary microplastics are those which already exist in the form of microplastics that is plastic waste which is already in the size range of less than 5 mm examples of primary microplastics include microfibers from clothing and textiles then micro beads from the cosmetic industry where microplastic beads are used in face wash scrubs toothpaste etc then we also have plastic pellets which is widely used in the industry so such microfibers micro beads plastic filaments etc which are already less than 5 mm in size they are referred to as primary microplastics and they are extensively contributing to immediate plastic pollution of our water bodies then we have secondary microplastics which are an outcome of degradation and weathering that is regular large size plastic waste such as plastic bottles plastic covers plastic packaging material etc they undergo the slow process of environmental degradation when subjected to weathering by the elements of nature and these large size plastic waste breaks down into smaller plastic particles thus resulting in the formation of secondary microplastics eventually they all accumulate in the water bodies and the toxins present will lead to bio accumulation and also bio magnification through which the toxin levels will start raising in the food chain hence environmental experts consider microplastics to be a grave threat to marine organisms and as well as to human beings who eventually consume them so the latest study conducted on the ganga river highlights the threat of microplastic pollution in india and the study brings out a shocking fact that the biggest source of plastic pollution and microplastic pollution in the ganga river is a result of untreated waste water and untreated solid waste and effluents which is directly entering the ganga river government data shows that there are 97 towns on the banks of the ganga river which together are releasing around 750 million liters of untreated sewage into the ganga river 
which happens to be one of the biggest contributors to high levels of plastic pollution in the Ganga River. These findings raises questions over the implementation and effectiveness of important government programs such as Swachh Bharat and Namami Gange. These are flagship programs of the central government and due to the high priority that has been given to these programs, these programs are also very well funded. But despite this, these programs have failed to achieve their objectives. The Swachh Bharat initiative is mainly focused on solid waste management, whereas Namami Gange initiative through its National Clean Ganga Mission is focused on tackling the problem of river pollution. But the widespread extensive pollution being recorded in the Ganga River raises questions on the effectiveness of these schemes and projects and it offers a very important lesson to the government. The study helps us understand that solid waste management and plastic waste management under Swachh Bharat is not just about collection of waste and dumping of waste. Unfortunately, right now, this is what is happening under Swachh Bharat. The central government, the state governments and the local governments that are responsible for implementing Swachh Bharat are excessively focused on just collection of waste and dumping and disposal of waste. They are just following a waste out of sight approach, but adequate focus is not being given on recycling and on cutting the generation and consumption of plastic. Solid waste management initiatives such as Swachh Bharat should prioritize the reduced generation and consumption of hazardous waste materials such as plastic and should also give utmost importance for recycling such waste materials. So containing microplastic pollution is entirely dependent on our waste management practices, especially with regard to solid waste and plastic waste. Currently, government capacity is being overwhelmed because plastic production and consumption continues to grow rapidly at an exponential rate, despite all the measures that the government has been taking. Here, it's not just the government which is responsible, but even the citizens and the industry are equally responsible. All the three tiers of the government, that is the center, states and the local governments, they have come up with several rules and regulations and they have launched several projects and schemes but their implementation has largely failed, not just due to the inefficiencies of the government, but also because of lack of cooperation from the citizens and the industry. The Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change has come out with solid waste management rules and plastic waste management rules. But unfortunately, the rules are not being strictly enforced and implemented. The Environment Ministry has even come out with a new draft to further tighten and strengthen the plastic waste management rules in the country. But despite all these rules and regulations, we won't be able to achieve any progress if citizens and the industry do not become more environment conscious. All the stakeholders need to work together to bring down the generation of plastic in the industry and the consumption of plastic by the citizens. The governments have tried many policies, but all of them have not yielded the desired results due to poor participation from both the citizens and the industry. For example, the government banned single-use plastic. But despite the ban, its usage and generation continues. Local bodies with the support of state governments enforced strict waste segregation at the source itself. But again, citizens and the industry are not following the strict segregation standards, thereby defeating the very purpose of such policies. Then to promote the concept of recycling, Labeling on packaging was made mandatory, but it hasn't generated enough awareness among the citizenry. And even the industry and the manufacturers, they've largely failed to abide by the concept of EPR or Extended Producer Responsibility, which has been implemented by the center. Through the concept of Extended Producer Responsibility, the manufacturers of plastic were given the extended responsibility to maintain the entire life cycle of plastic. That is right from its production to consumption to recycling, the manufacturers were supposed to play a lead role in the management of this life cycle of plastic waste, which would also help in the recovery of materials, which could then be recycled and repurposed, thereby reducing waste generation. So at the national level and at the local level, what we need is the coordination between governments, citizens and industry. And with the participation of all the stakeholders, the governments need to strive towards 
better enforcement and implementation of existing rules and policies and schemes. Then at the same time, we also require a global treaty to deal with plastic waste, especially considering the global threat posed by microplastics. Because see, pollution and environmental degradation is not restricted to any country. It is not limited by national borders. This is a global problem that we are dealing with, especially with regard to plastic waste management. Almost every country is struggling, including developed nations. And hence, there is a dire need for a fair and comprehensive international treaty, probably under the United Nations, either on the lines of the Montreal Protocol or the Paris Agreement. The Montreal Protocol, which was signed in 1987, was a landmark treaty to eliminate ozone depleting substances in order to protect the ozone layer from depletion, which had been caused by the emissions of CFCs or chlorofluorocarbons. Today, the Montreal Protocol is a great success because the world has largely eliminated ozone depleting substances and the ozone layer, which had been depleted, especially near the poles, has even started recovering. Then we have the Paris Agreement under the Climate Change Convention that provides for global climate action efforts, which today is helping the world to move towards carbon neutrality. So on similar lines, we would require a global treaty to deal with plastic waste. And hence, India must work with the United Nations and other like-minded countries to focus on plastic waste management and microplastics by bringing out a comprehensive international treaty that regulates plastic waste management. Now let's take up a column from page number six in which the writer appreciates a recent ruling of the Supreme Court through which it has sought to move away from the anthropocentric basis of laws and instead has adopted biocentric jurisprudence in order to promote nature conservation. See, as the name itself indicates, Anthropocentric basis of law means that those laws which are human centric. In the philosophy of anthropocentrism, humans are considered to be at the center and they are regarded as the most significant species. Under this philosophy of thought, it is considered justifiable for humans to exploit the resources of nature and environment, even at the risk of causing great harm to the environment and other species. Basically, under the philosophy of anthropocentrism and under laws that are based on anthropocentrism, there is no regard given to the rights of the environment or to the rights of nature and to the rights of other species. Under this philosophy of thought and under this legal basis or legal jurisprudence, human rights are considered to be everything and the most significant and it is considered justifiable for humans to exploit natural resources and environmental resources even when it is causing great damage to the environment and to the other species. This philosophy of thought and this legal jurisprudence has been encouraged since many, many centuries. And you can find this philosophy of thought even in the works of thinkers such as Aristotle, where he talks about anthropocentrism in his work, Politics. You can even find the same philosophy of thought in the moral philosophy of Immanuel Kant. And even today in the modern world, in most countries around the world, all their laws and their constitution, they are anthropocentric and doesn't give any recognition of rights to nature, to environment and to other species. The impact of such anthropocentrism in our laws is best highlighted in the snail darter case of 1973, which took place in the United States. In 1973, a biologist from the University of Tennis had discovered a new species of fish called the snail darter. This new species of fish was discovered in the Little Tennis River, where the government was seeking to develop a large reservoir project. But the biologist who discovered this new species of fish argued that it is an endangered species and the construction of this large project could possibly wipe out this entire species. So following this, a lawsuit was filed challenging the reservoir project and the case reached all the way up to the Supreme Court where the Supreme Court of the United States held that the snail darter fish which was recently discovered has been given the protected status under the National Environment Policy Act and on this basis it prohibited the executive from executing this reservoir project. 
In this landmark case, the Supreme Court of the United States basically upheld the protected status of the species. But however, the US Congress immediately stepped in. And on the basis of anthropocentrism, it immediately brought out a new law which ended up overturning the ruling of the Supreme Court. By enacting this law, the Congress declared retrospectively that snail darter is not a protected species, thereby allowing the project to continue. And as a result, this endangered fish and its population suffered significantly. So the snail darter case and the follow-up law which was brought out by the US Congress to overturn the ruling is a classic example of anthropocentrism in our laws and in our constitutions. It's a widely held philosophy that in the larger interest of the humans, the well-being of the environment and the other species can be ignored and such anthropocentric laws do not give any recognition to the rights of nature. The opposite of this philosophy is biocentrism. Under this school of thought, nature is considered to be at the center where human beings are one of the species who have to cohabit and coexist with all the other species. The laws that are brought out under this school of thought is referred to as biocentric jurisprudence, which prioritizes nature conservation as it is seen to be integral to the overall development of human beings along with other species because of the complex interlinkages that exist in the environment. So when there are laws that are brought out that prioritizes nature conservation, even at the cost of human development, or when nature and environment and other species are accorded a certain set of rights through a legal framework or through the constitution itself, then such an approach is known as a biocentric approach. Based on these nature-centric laws, if the judiciary rules in favor of nature conservation, then we refer to it as biocentric jurisprudence. Of late, the rights of nature movement is gaining ground around the world and several countries are actually inculcating the rights of nature into their law books. Ecuador, the Latin American country, became the first country in the world in 2008 to recognize the rights of nature through its legal system. This was followed up by another Latin American country, that is Bolivia, which has also adopted a rights of nature law into its constitution itself. Then more recently in 2010, the US city of Pittsburgh became the first major municipality in the United States to recognize rights of nature laws, under which the local communities are given powers to defend the rights of the nature. Under such biocentric laws, nature rights are recognized, which accords a set of rights to mountains, rivers, etc. And the local communities, which are affected by projects, or if there are development projects that threaten the rights of nature, then local communities can defend them by making use of these legal provisions. The writer points out that such nature-centric laws are much needed because unchecked human development has resulted in major destruction of our environment and biodiversity. The writer points out how 50 years ago, there were close to half a million lions in Africa, but today their numbers have been reduced to just around 20,000. He also points out the threat posed by monoculture farming, especially in the Borneo forests and in Sumatra, which has led to the extinction of orangutans. He points out the poaching of rhinos, for the so-called medicinal value of their horns and how the species is becoming extinct because of this. He refers to the human exploitation of Madagascar and how several species of lemurs have been driven towards extinction. As per the IUCN or the International Union for Conservation of Nature and according to its red list or the red data book, more than 37,000 species today are gravely endangered, largely because of unchecked human development. And hence, the writer says that there is an immediate need around the world to shift towards biocentric jurisprudence by moving away from anthropocentric basis of laws. The writer even examines the Indian constitution in this regard and points out that the Indian constitution is largely silent with regard to rights of nature. The Indian constitution does not explicitly recognize any rights of nature, but it merely places a fundamental duty on the citizens to safeguard the environment and biodiversity. But the constitution remains entirely silent on the rights of nature and environment and the rights of other species, and it places no obligation on the state to protect the environment and the biodiversity.
Considering that the Indian constitution is anthropocentric and not biocentric, the writer praises the judiciary, especially the Supreme Court, for standing up to the environment and biodiversity by giving a wider interpretation to Article 21 of the constitution. Through repeated judgments, the Supreme Court has expanded the scope of Article 21 and it has recognized right to a clean environment, right to clean air and clean water to be integral to right to life under Article 21. This highlights the role of the Supreme Court in shifting away from India's anthropocentric laws towards biocentric jurisprudence. This philosophy and approach of the Supreme Court was very much evident in the recent M.K. Ranjit Singh case which dealt with the critically endangered great Indian bustard. This critically endangered bird is a heavy bird which is endemic to the Indian subcontinent and it is usually found in arid semi-arid grasslands. Several years ago, thousands of these birds could be found across Maharashtra, Gujarat, Rajasthan, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, etc. But today, the species has been depleted and driven towards extinction and hardly there are 200 birds left in the wild and they are all concentrated in just two states that is Gujarat and Rajasthan. This critically endangered bird species is being threatened by overhead power lines in these two states and environmental activists and NGOs have been making repeated appeals to the private companies and the state governments and the center to take immediate measures to safeguard the great Indian bustard from the overhead power lines. See, these birds, they lack frontal vision. So as a result, they are not able to clearly see as to what lies ahead of them. And they often run into these overhead power lines and they fail to maneuver away from them at the last minute because of their heavier size. So they crash into the power lines resulting in their death, which today is the primary reason that is driving the species towards extinction. So environmental organizations and conservation activists they wanted the power companies and the governments to take immediate steps to install bird diverters and to shift the overhead power lines underground in order to safeguard the bird population. But the companies and the governments were not ready to do this as it incurred a huge cost and this again shows the anthropocentric nature of development. Eventually a petition was filed in the Supreme Court to seek protection for the great Indian bustard and in a landmark ruling the Supreme Court has adopted biocentric jurisprudence and it has directed the companies and the governments to take immediate steps to install bird diverters which can safeguard the birds and also consider shifting the overhead power cables to underground so that the critically endangered birds could be protected. In passing this ruling in the MK Ranjit Sin case, the Supreme Court has ignored the financial cost that is to be incurred by the companies and the government in taking these measures. And instead, it has given a higher priority for the protection of this critically endangered bird, thereby marking a shift away from anthropocentric basis of laws towards biocentric jurisprudence. Then finally, let's look at this article from page number 9. The Supreme Court has said that secrecy of vote must be maintained in any election, be it elections to the parliament or to a state legislature. Maintaining the secrecy of voting is a must because it is an integral part of fundamental right to freedom of expression guaranteed under Article 19. The voting preferences of a citizen is an integral part of his right to expression. So be it direct elections to Lok Sabha or the state legislature, the maintenance of secrecy of voting is a must because this will enable the voter to cast his vote without any fear of being victimized or being intimidated by the political parties. The Supreme Court has stated, that secrecy of voting must be protected at any cost as a fundamental right and the election commission will have to ensure that elections are held in a free and fair manner by dealing strictly with booth capturing and bogus voting because this subverts the rule of law and thereby subverts democracy itself. Through these rulings, the Supreme Court has again upheld that democracy and free elections are a part of the basic structure of the constitution. Next, on page number six, we have another editorial the deals with Brexit and the Good Friday Agreement. But we have already covered this topic in detail on the 15th of July. So kindly go back and watch this video and go through this analysis once. Now let's look at the mains practice questions. The first question, India must take its loss on waste management seriously to stop microplastics pollution. 
discussed by highlighting the extent of microplastic pollution in the Ganga River. The second question. In a recent ruling, the Supreme Court of India has sought to move away from an anthropocentric basis of law. It upheld the biocentric principles of coexistence, which has come as a shot in the arm for nature conservation. Examine. Kindly write an answer to these questions and post your answers in the comment section below. So this concludes our discussion for today. Thanks for watching.